The Burning Heart Written by Colin Leonard I once had a brother. My brother fell in love. We used to play music together up at the crossroads on spontaneous nights when the youth of the area would gather to drink and dance in the summer moonlight. I played the fiddle. Sean battered a rhythm on the bowron. I figured something was amiss when his timing began to drift mid-song. His eyes would wander to the cluster of girls twirling near the bonfire. His ear wouldn't hear my strings. Once, he even let the tipper fall from his fingers and his knuckles rub the goat skin instead. Are you playing with me or not? I said. Or is it out dancing that you want to be? Ah, shut your face, he said. He grabbed a bottle from the bucket of icy water and slobbered foamy beer down his chin. The dancing feet noticed the loss of his beat, so I stood up and replaced it with a steady clap that they all joined in with until somebody yelped and whooped a finish to the song. Tommy Murphy sang a slow ballad to give us a break from playing the instruments, and my girl, Aoife, came over to drink a whiskey with me. What's up with Sean? she said. Who knows, I replied. I don't know where his mind is at all these days. The next day, Aoife, clever girl that she is, figured out what was bothering my brother. We were down by the riverbank, the three of us. We often spent a lazy afternoon there if we'd finished our day's work early. The rods were cast in for fish, but there wasn't much biting. Sean had been silent for the whole walk there, and while Aoife and myself were lying down in the long grass, basking in the sun, he stared into the water, flicking pebbles. "'You'll scare them fish with your stones,' I said to him. "'That loud sighing will scare them too. What's the matter with you?' "'It's not in the matter,' he grunted. Aoife smiled. "'I know what the matter is.' I saw how you were staring over at us all dancing last night. Which one have you got your eye on? Is it Grania? You don't know what the hell you're talking about. He clattered off, not even bothering to bring his rod. Aoife tucked her head against my chest. I think it's sweet, she said. I remember how you were before I said yes to you moping around like the world was crushing your poor soul. He's exactly the same as you were. I remembered those days, too. Back then, I thought I'd do anything in the world to have her. But I don't think that I would have done what my brother did. I don't think I would have gone that far. We shared a room, my brother and I. Although we were breaking into manhood... We were still only boys, really, under our father's roof. In the summer, we preferred to sleep with the window open for air, but that would also let in the insects. I thought it was a wasp that woke me, buzzing and biting. I swatted at my face, but it wasn't the noise of a stinger that had caused me to wake. Sean was kneeling down by his bed, droning low and constant. It was still deep in the night. There was a black candle before him, jammed into a split stone, the flame long and dancing, smoke curling toward the window. He was repeating a sentence to himself. I made out the words, fire and love. The next morning, before rising, I confronted him about it. If our mother found out, she'd have you out of the house. Found out what? he said. That you're messing about with devil prayers. Aoife was right, wasn't she? You're trying to snare some girl's heart. It won't turn out well for you if you do it that way. Well, God won't answer my prayers, he snarled. He pulled on his clothes and said no more to me that morning. Silent through breakfast, silent through the work in the fields. When it came to dinner time, he walked away ahead of me. We used to always walk together. He strode past the house, giving it a wide berth, 
avoiding our mother's call to food. Sean, where are you going? I yelled after him. He glanced back, but didn't answer. I stuck my head in the door and told our parents to start without us. Then I trotted off in the direction he had gone. When I caught sight of him up ahead, he had a slithery gait to him that stopped me from calling out. Sean always stood upright and bouncy, but now he was sneaking along the side of the laneways, watching that no one was spying on him. I moved stealthy enough, too, staying tight to the wild ditches and keeping a fair distance. He hopped the gate at the old limestone quarry, the one that had been closed after what they'd found there. After what they found, everyone called it the Devil's Pit. A line of mean crows had gathered on the gate, and they didn't fly off when I approached. They latched angry, beady eyes upon me, twitching their talons as I climbed across. Brambles and nettles had taken hold in the ground, but there was a trampled path through them. It led all the way down to the cave where the bones had been discovered. I'd been in there before years ago. Most of us had crept in at some stage as youngsters just to see what had frightened people so much that strong quarrymen would give up their jobs and the owner would let his sight sit in ruin. Most of us only visited once. There were hundreds of bones, human and animal, all joined together to create a huge figure on a throne made of more bones. Skulls of small animals decorated the structure. A goat's skull was fixed on top as a horrible head with dark hollow eye holes. I peered in and saw Sean kneeling down at the fire pit that was dug before it. A flame caroused inside the pit. The black candles were laid out and burning. He had something in his hands that looked familiar. What are you doing with that? I said. His back turned stiff. I could have sworn I saw a spark of fire crackle from his fingers. That's Aoife's scarf. Why have you got it? He folded the green woolen material in his hands and stood to face me. You don't own her. She's not yours to keep. His eyes were like the ones the crows had fixed on me. Give that to me, now! I went to take it from him, and he punched me in the chest. There was a rattling from the bony statue. Go away home, brother! He punched me again, gritting his teeth. My heart is on fire! There's no putting it out. The wrongness of the cave and the sight of him inside it made my lips tighten and my breathing shallow. I thumped him once across the temple. A bone fell from the throne, made a clinking sound like a beak on a window. I grabbed him by the throat, too angry to use words, wanting to squeeze the badness out of him. He kicked at my legs and pulled at my hair. A breeze blew from deep in the cave, whistling ghostly through the gaps in the statue. He twisted my hair tight to my scalp and clawed at my cheek, but I kept choking him. His eyes bulged black and fierce at me. Finally, I threw him off and he fell down gasping. I wanted to kick sense into him, take up those bones and batter him with them. My head was spinning and my ears filled with the breeze, squealing as if the strings of my fiddle had been stretched to their most tuneless tension. It was too much to withstand. I ran out. I ran home and used the water barrel to wash myself clean before going inside. "'Where's your brother?' said my mother. Were you fighting? my father asked. Two plates remained untouched that night. I couldn't eat. I went round to Aoife's house, but I couldn't sit still with her and couldn't keep up with any conversation. I should have told her then about my brother and what he was doing, but instead I just asked her to make sure 
that her father latched the door and that she kept her windows closed all night. When she asked why, I said there was talk of thieves passing through the area. There's a part of me that reckons I didn't tell her in case it created a seed of a notion in her. I didn't want to have an idea like that, sticking roots into her mind and spreading branches through her body. I was insecure. I feared that she might get attracted by a different desire being out there, burning that hot for her, if she knew about it. When I got home, I tried to fill my dreams with her blue eyes, but sleep didn't come easily, and when it finally arrived, it only brought nightmares. I worked on my own the next day. Sean didn't come home for dinner again. I told my parents that it wasn't because of the fight, that he was shacked up with some girl, that he was running hot with the love fever, and all we could do was wait until it boiled off. "'You'll be going to the crossroads tonight, I suppose,' said my mother. "'Maybe he'll be there.' "'Dancing and drinking and carousing,' said my father. "'Yous make the devil proud with the carryings on that happen up there.' Ah, leave him be. They're just being young, that's all. If either of those boys gets some girl in trouble, then they'll not remain under this roof. They're just playing music, is all. Just brothers playing their music together. I left them bickering and grumbling and grabbed my fiddle. As always, I went the long way and waited at the end of Aoife's laneway. Her friend, Kathleen, who lived next door, usually accompanied her. Nobody would risk a young girl walking out in the dark on her own, and it wouldn't look right for me to collect her unchaperoned and take her out into the night. I leaned against a fat oak trunk and started to tune the fiddle. The strings sounded odd tones when I plucked them into the hazy night air. I heard their voices coming up the lane before I saw them, two girls laughing, but I was sure there was a third, a greedy male voice in there, too. Was it from farther behind them? Was it in my head? When I listened closer, all I heard were the hungry squeaks of a bat. There was no third person with them when they appeared. "'Was somebody else walking with you?' I asked, without a smile or a greeting first. "'He's a jealous one, isn't he?' said Kathleen. "'Who in God's name would be walking with us?' said Aoife. "'It's just... I don't know. I thought I heard someone.' "'Where's Sean tonight?' she asked. At the crossroads, the drinking had started, about twelve people there, and when I arrived they cheered for the promise of music. The bonfire was churning black smoke that stung my eyes. Tommy Murphy had his own bow run with him, and he accompanied me in Sean's absence. He didn't have my brother's excited tempo. His rhythm was careful and stayed, tiptoeing one beat carefully after the next. The beers in the bucket were cold. The whiskey was warming my throat between songs. Aoife danced in a circle with her friends, and I dived into a looping, curling tune with my eyes closed and my bow flowing. Often, I used to get lost in the songs, aware only of my fingers on the frets and the bow on the strings. My breathing swam along with the melody, and behind my eyelids, I saw the colors of the music like magic, like fire. When I opened them, there was a new arrival to the dance. Tommy kept beating his bowron. For once, his pace turned as fast as a galloping horse. Sean was there, darkness clouding his movements, and the crowd scattered away from him. He had grabbed Aoife and was leading her a frantic step to the tune I'd stopped playing. She laughed at first, giddy and spry, but as he twirled her around, her expression grew worried. The fire had lifted high and hot, and everyone else kept well back from it. 
The flames rose and swirled and grew in the shape of a figure that danced with them. It must have stood ten feet tall, and I could see that Aoife was scared of it, and she was scared of Sean, but I couldn't get near them. Each time I approached, a blast of heat drove me away. It danced with them and laughed with them, and then it leaned in and it embraced them. Nowadays, people tell me about times they've seen my brother. Sometimes they hear him wailing in the fields near the old quarry, or screaming as if he's still on fire. If they catch sight of him, they tell me that his skin is red and blistered, that he has only frayed scraps of hair, that half his face is melted away. We don't know how he survives out there, what he eats or drinks, where he lays his ruined head, but he'll never be given solace in any house. The last time I saw him myself was at the funeral, a shadowed figure on the hill above the graveyard. I saw him through tears I thought would never stop. He ran off when she was lowered into the ground, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Most of her had been turned to ashes already. That night she died. I once had a brother. My brother fell in love. I once had a girl.